Hello and welcome to this second exploring session as we look at this new interlude of Vice containing the history of Orestes with the cruel revenge revengement of his father's death upon his unnatural mother by John Pickering, uh, printed uh, in 1567 and produced probably pretty much bang on top of that. Um, this is a play doing all sorts of interesting things with the story of Orestes uh, off to uh, revenge his father's murder uh, by uh, taking out his mother and uh, and assorted uh, uh, lover, uh, uh, I this and probably anyone else in his way. In this particular play, we have uh, not only him turning up like a sort of lone commando, but um, he's actually recruited a, a whacking great army to, uh, to come along with him. And we keep uh, zooming out of the main narrative into uh, sort of individual characters who we don't necessarily ever see again, soldiers and, uh, and various other uh, rustic figures in the, in the first half. Uh, as well as also the, the allegorical personification of nature who told him that he shouldn't go out and, uh, and do this murdery stuff. Um, but he's also semi-dogged by the character of the Vice, um, who, um, who is whispering sweet nothings in his ear to go out and, uh, and do the deed. And uh, generally the Vice has been sowing disorder with anyone he talks to. He's managed to uh, spark at least one fight between uh, two comedy rustics. Um, and that seems to be his, his superpower is disorder and chaos. Uh, we do not as of yet know the real name of the vice. He has been get, he's turned up pretending to be various things, courage most recently. Um, and so it's gonna be interesting to see where this play goes in its final half. To explore this text, we are uh, we're surrounded by these wonderful uh, readers who are going to uh, uh, spout their opinions and say the words of the play in approximately the correct order. Reading today, Soldier, uh, Fame and Commons is... Francis. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I, uh, yeah, I missed something there. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, my name's Francis Cox. I'm an actor living in Amsterdam. Uh, reading a woman, uh, Agisthus and Hermione is... Hello, I'm Helen Good. I'm a historian living in Yorkshire. Uh, reading Clytemnestra and Idumius today is... Hello, my name is Lynn Freitas. I'm a college writing teacher. I live in the Northwestern United States. Reading Herald, Provision and some Nobles is... Hi, I'm Eric, and yeah, uh, I just realized that Hermione is not the character from Harry Potter, it's the character from, you know, mythology, who is actually the daughter of Helen uh, of Troy, who is actually Helen of Sparta. Unless it is actually from Harry Potter, in which case this play is going to go in a very, very weird direction. Uh, reading Menelaus and Duty today is... Oh, I'm Lois, I'm a retired academic living in London. Uh, reading The Vice, Nestor and Truth is... Hello, I'm Dan. I'm an actor from Montpellier, France. And reading Orestes is... Hi, I'm Alan Scott, based in Suffolk, neither an actor nor an academic. And having been a vice yesterday, I'm now under arrest. Thank you. And... Uh... <laughs> We are about halfway through the play uh, in the uh, scheme that we're working from. We're going from scene seven. The original text doesn't actually have scenes in it, but this uh, so far functions as whenever the stage is cleared. Uh, that's what we're calling a scene. So we're going into uh, scene seven. We've just had a scene with Agisthus and Clytemnestra uh, saying that, hey, there's an army outside our walls. It's fine. We've got really strong walls, so it'll be, it'll be fine. Uh, so going into this scene, we have enter a woman like a, uh, a beggar uh, running before soldier, uh, but let the soldier speak first, uh, but um, let the woman cry first piteously. <laughs> Yield thee, I say, and the by and by, or with this sword in faith thou shalt die. Oh, with a good will I yield me to thee. Good master soldier, have mercy on me. My husband thou hast slain in most cruel wise. Yet this my prayer do not now despise. Come on then in haste, my prisoner thou art. Come, follow me, I say. We must needs depart. 
go afore her and let her fall down upon the uh, soldier and all to beat him. Oh, horse and slave! I will teach thee, Fay, to handle a woman on another way, to put me in fear without my desert. I will teach thee, Fay, to play such a part. Be contented, good woman, and thou shalt be never hereafter molested for me. Nay, villain slave, amends thou shalt make, in that thou before me as a prisoner did take. Now I have caught thee, and my prisoner thou art, by his wounds go horse and slave, this goes to thy heart. Nay! And uh, takes up his weapons and let him rise up and then both uh, go, uh, go out both. Nay, save my life, for I will be thy prisoner, and lo, I yield to thee. Come, wend thou with me, and thy weapons thou shalt have, sith thou, thou vouchsafe my life for to save. Yes, another one of those interesting instances where the stage direction sort of preempts the thing that's about to happen rather than follows it. Um, <clears throat> but that's an interesting scene, especially following on from a couple of weeks ago, though it hasn't been released yet to the general public, of uh, looking at one of the Killing of the Children plays where the, the women go for, for one of the soldiers. And it's really interesting that we have, it, again, a scene here where, uh, where the soldier is lulled into a false sense of security to walk ahead of uh, the woman and then gets laid upon and uh, taken and uh, disarmed. It's a really interesting scene. Thoughts in the room? He's not much of a soldier. <laughs> if he's one of the characters we had earlier, uh, then, then no, he's not. <laughs> also, the decision she makes at the end she says, I'll trust you with your arms if you will promise to keep me safe. We can make a deal together. Mm. You can have your sword back if you use it to defend me. Now, I mean, she's taking a chance there. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what her choices are. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. Uh, Eric? I was going to say it reminded me of that whole sequence with Watkin uh, in in uh, you know the Herod play um, mm. where he just he's there for the comedy basically gets beaten up by women and then sort of doesn't really he runs off basically he's he's this uh, kid who wants to become part of the army and decides <laughs> um, that he you know he he wants to be a knight instead of I don't know a messenger or sort of a squire. And thinks he's ready, but he's not. Yeah, it's 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 very like that. Though of course, in this case, it's a, it's a one to one situation rather than a group group attack. Francis. Yeah, I just have to say that while I was reading it, I was thinking, God, I wish Helen and I could put this thing on its feet as we're used to doing in Italy. <laughs> 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 Yeah. It was great fun to do. It was great fun, that, that scene. Well, it's, it's, it's got really detailed stage directions. I mean, mm. apart from the odd elided word, um, you know, those those are the original um, stage directions. There's um, uh, you know, the, this, this whole text is full of these little details that, uh, you know, it's telling us pretty much how to do this uh, and pretty clearly. Um, very short scene. We managed to get quite a lot mm. out of that. Um, uh, any additional thoughts before we move forward? No. OK, let's go into uh, what we're calling scene eight. Enter the voice uh, singing this song to the tune of the painter. So, uh, vice, you don't have to sing, but uh, uh, give it give it a give it a, 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 a have fun. Do what you want. Stand back, you sleeping jacks to home and let me go. You lie, sir, neither my your mum, why say you so? Tut tut, you dare not come in field, for fear you should the ghost up yield. With blows he goes, the gun shall fly, it fears and sears and dare not lie. A hundredth in a moment be destroyed, destroyed yet quite. So sauce and faith, if sure you should see the gun shot light. To quake for fear you would not stint, when as by force of gunshot stint, the rank and ray are took away, and please the fortune off to play. 
What in this tower who bears the fame? But only I. Revenge, revenge will have the name or he will die. I spare no whites, I fear none ill. But with this blade, I will them kill. For when mine ear is set on fire, I wrap them and snap them. That is my desire. Farewell, adieu to wars, I must in all the haste. My cousin cut were purse, will I trust your post well taste? But to it, man, and fearful not, me say to thee, it is well fraught. With Roddick's red be at a beck, beware the arse, break not thy neck. And exit the vice. Um, lovely, lovely rendition there, uh, Dan. Um, it's a really fun uh, song. Uh, I believe we don't actually have a, 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 a the tune, or we don't know if we have the tune, yeah. the painter. Uh, it's always very difficult to tell. Um, uh, so, uh, but there are there are other uh, tunes from a uh, reasonable uh, uh, area of the period that uh, there, there may be analogues that we could use um, that are vaguely period specific. Um, it does end on a really nice closing line. I mean, it, it does just that does all. It's, it's always when you yeah beware the arse, break not thy neck. Um, <laughs> always leap towards the low material lie don't i um <laughs> any thoughts on just that that the sort of little interlude of songs it does not connect with the, the 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 next scene or the rest of the scene depending how this is marked up uh helen yeah i mean I, it, my theory that vice has joined the army would mm. it, it would fit very well with that mm. that vice is now in the army, um, obviously not necessarily permanently, but he's with them for the moment. So I can see him coming on as mm. part of the army. Mm. Well, he's following Orestes, presumably, so um, there might be a bit of that. Um, uh, again, we've, we've paused very, very quickly. So uh, uh, any additional thoughts on that song? Um, we've gone from this sort of moment of high drama, uh, but then perhaps I don't sort of knock about comedy. I don't know what, where to place precisely the soldier and the woman uh, scene. Then we have this definite uh, uh, comedy moment, but also perhaps something dark going on with the vice. And now we're going back into uh, the the main part of the action. Uh, it's it it does this play just keeps changing its, our direction. I find that really interesting. Okay, uh, let's go into um, what's currently noted down as the rest of the scene, but I think that should really be down as a separate scene. So Orestes entereth with his band and marcheth about the stage. Come on, my soldiers, for at home arrived there we be, whereas we must have our desire or else die manfully. The walls be high, yet I intend upon them first to go, and, as I hope, you soldiers, will your captain eke follow? If I forsake to go before, then flay you, eke be bind. And as I am, so eke I trust my soldiers for to find. Come hither, herald, go proclaim this mine intent straightway. To yonder city say that I am come to their decay. Unless they yield, I will destroy both man, woman and child and eke their towers, for th that for the war they st so strongly do they build. Bid them in haste to yield to me, for naught I do abide, but for their answer, or else forthwith, for them and theirs provide. Your, your gracious mind shall straight be done. Come, trumpet, let us go. That I have done your message well, your grace shall well full know. And let the trumpet, so another member of the cast, uh, go toward the city and blow. I <laughs> the apace, and let me have again an answer soon. And then anon thou shalt well see what quickly shall be done. Let the trumpet leave sounding, and let the herald speak, and Clytemnestra speak over the wall. How, who, who is there that keeps the gate? Give my give ear my words unto. What wouldst thou have, Herald? Declare. What hast thou to do here to do? My master bids thee yield to him this city out of hand, or else he will not leave one stone on other for to stand, and all things else uh, within this town he will have at his will. 
as pleaseth him as pleaseth him by me, any means to save or else to spill. What you will now therefore declare and answer to him send. This city against him and his I will defend. Then in his name I do defy both thee and all within. By him and his tell him in sooth we do not set a pin. And so the Herald leaves Clytemnestra, returns to Orestes. I don't know whether that, that's, that seems to be an interpolated stage direction. Uh, if it please your grace, this word she sends, she will not yield to ye. But if you come unto your harm, she says that it will be. Let the Herald go out here. Sith that my grace and eat goodwill, they on such sort despise, but to destroy both man and child, I surely do devise. Come on, my men, bend now your force this city for to win, save no man's life that once should make resistance there within. And when you shall possess the town and have all things at will, look out my mother, but to her do ye no kind of ill. Let her not die, though that she would desire the death to have, for otherwise my father's death or revengement doth crave. We shall, we shall your hests obey with speed, O captain, we desire, that we were there for to revenge, our hearts are set on fire. And around here, the vice needs to have re-entered. He may have re-entered earlier. Like men by God, I swear, well said, Orestes, let us go. Now to thy men, like manly heart, I pray thee for to show. And as thou say, seest, be first the man that shall the city win. How, how? Now, for to fly, already they begin. With lively hearts, my trumpeters, exalt your tubal sound. And now, my soldiers, in your hearts, let courage eke be found. Come, let us go. The gods for us shall make an easy way. Spend none alive, for I am bent to seek their great decay. Uh, go and make your lively battle. Off you go. Uh, and let it be long, let it be long, ere you can win the city. And when you have won it, let Orestes bring out his mother by the arms uh, and let the drum cease playing and the trumpet also. When she is taken, let her kneel down and speak. Alack, what heaps of mischief great me, silly white torment. Now is the time fallen me upon which I thought to prevent. Yet best I seek my life to save. Perhaps he will me here. Alack, revengement he doth crave for slaying his father dear. If any sparks of mother's blood remain within his breast, O gracious child, let now nine ears unto my words be pressed. Pardon, I crave, Horestes mine, sit now my corpse from death. Let no man say that you was cause I yielded up my breath. I have offended, I do confess, yet save my life, I pray, and do they, thy mother, this request, O knight, do not deny. But to repent this fact of thine, now that it is too late, cannot be thought a recompense for killing of thy mate. Go, have her hence, therefore, with speed, and see her surely kept, and for that fact, afore thou diest. Thou surely shouldst have wept. And Clytemester goes out with uh, one of the soldiers. Nay, fare you well. In faith, you have an answer. Get you hence. Loons of me, I would not be in her coat for forty pence. Nay, nay, away. Farewell, adieu. Now, now, it is too late. When steed is stolen for you in sooth to shut the stable gate. She should have wept when first she went, the king about to slay. It makes no matter. She full well did breed her own decay. And uh, let, let Orestes sigh hard. Oh. Oh, Oons of me, what mean you, man? Begin you now to faint? Jesus, God, how still he sits. I think he may be a saint. Oh, oh, you care not for me. Nay, soon I have done, I warrant ye. And the vice now weeps, but let Orestes rise and bid him peace. By all the gods, my heart did fail, my mother fit to see, from high estate for to be brought to so great misery. But 
almost I had granted life to her, had not this be my father's death, whose death, in sooth, the chief causer of was she. Even as you say, the Harker Hand, Agistus draweth nigh, who purposeth the chance of war, Orestes for to try. And yes, let Agistus enter and set his men in array, and let the drum play till Orestes speak it. And by the gods I purpose eke my honour to defend. Come on, my men, keep your array, for now we do pretend either to be the conqueror or else to die in field. Lift up your hearts and let us see how ye your blows can yield. Like manly men, address yourselves to get immortal fame. If ye do fly, lo, what doth rest behind but foul defame? Strike up your drums, let trumpets sound, your banners eke display. And I myself as captain, to you will lead the way. Thou traitor to my father dear, what makes thee here in field? Repent thee of thy wickedness, and to me straight do yield. Thou princox boy, and bastard slave, think'st thou me to subdue? It lieth not within thy power, thou boy, I tell thee true. But if I take thy corpse, it shall be a food for the birds to feed. Strike up your drums and forward now. To wars let us proceed. And strike up the drum and fight a good while. And while they're fighting, I'm just going to tell that about opportunity to have a bit of a pause. And yeah, this is the point in the play where defining what we might in a modern way say are scenes becomes slightly more problematic because we have what are clearly intended to be quite extensive battle sequences. Um, you know, go and make your lively battle and let it be long. <laughs> I love the version who wrote the stage directions. I'm hoping Pickering is, is doing this. Um, so, yeah, we and we got multiple uh, battle scenes. So they take Clytemnestra and then Aegisthus turns up with his men reinforcing. So you hope for lots and lots of people. And Though the opening of the uh, of the, uh, the the printed text says you know six can play this and gives us a doubling chart, well they might be able to play the principles, but this play clearly definitely needs more, and the doubling is a bit dodgy in places, um, though mostly workable. Um, so yeah, there's it's we've suddenly got some un un unremitting action. You know we have the the parley, the trumpeter there's there's a wall that you know there is set um all sorts of things are being thrown at this thoughts in the room about this this sort of exciting sequence that we're midway through there's no insult worse than calling the commander of an army a boy mm. haven't we had that somewhere else yes mm. it comes up quite a lot yeah but this is your stepfather stepson relationship, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Yes. Uh, you do get the impression that Aegisthus <clears throat> is trying slightly too hard as well when he's making his warlike speeches. Um, you know. Oh, I meant every word. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see him as a slight, slightly Captain Mannering uh, type character. Mm. You know, a bit puffed up with his own importance, but not a lot in going on behind the eyes. Well, he seemed a bit more desperate to me. The, you mm. know, the, the situation, Clytemnestra's, you know, been, you know, mm. is, uh, is, uh, has been captured and, you know, that's his rock. So I, I'm wondering there. I do like Orestes' line about uh, my trumpeter's exalt your tubal sound. I think that is mm. a wonderful turn of phrase. Um, <laughs> other thoughts in the room? Uh, Lynn, then Francis. This is more of a, a question then. A con more a question than a comment. So what's the vice weeping about? Is he pretending to be remorseful about Clytemnestra's um, ensuing death, upcoming death? Is that what's going on? I, 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 I think so, because he's reacting to Her uh, Orestes' sigh in the stage direction with he sighs hard. Um, so it's like he's going, well, I cut, you know, any sort of what, what means you, man? Uh, why are you sad? So it's like he's trying to, is he competing? That kind of thing, because we we've had this idea of comic business of clowns 
doing exaggerated crying for reasons as other, uh, otherwise. I'm going to leap to Helen before I come back to Francis. Um, I think he's what he's saying is, you haven't killed her, you break my heart. Mm. Mm. It's oh. because he hasn't killed her. Mm. Uh, bad, That's why bad, he's sad. But very bad forward planning, isn't it? Um, you know, the, the, the vice is here for the for the deaths, isn't he? And yeah. so, Francis, then Lois. Uh, yeah, I just have to say I was um, disappointed. Clasmonestra was um, captured so easily. Um, it was a long battle. Stage production <laughs> told us. Oh right, it, it was just a long seemed... dumb show. <laughs> oh, it's half an hour's <laughs> passed. Half an hour. <laughs> it seemed, yeah, it seemed relatively easy because uh, I always think Clasmonestra as being this very strong, powerful, almost operatic female character. So, um, I, yeah, I was just disappointed she was overcome so easily. Yeah, oh, well, I think we can insert a, a lengthy hand-to-hand uh, -hand fight sequence from Clytemnestra before she's captured. I think we, we can arrange that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Lois was... Uh... Well, I was thinking that maybe the vice is weeping and those, oh, ooh, he's just taking the mickey out of uh, Orestes. Uh, mm. um, oh, 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 so sad, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's certainly how I read it. Mm. It didn't seem to be, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, genuine. I'm not saying I couldn't have been done another way, but there doesn't seem to be any kind of genuine weeping. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't yeah. think the vice does sincere. No. Yeah. Ever. And, and in the first half, we were talking about how he's frequently has a dress that is clearly audience focused, um, and that his verse actually act actively changes when he does that. Um, and so the, the, these moments are, are, are probably not to, to Orestes at all, um, or only a percentage of it is. And negotiating that in performance is, is a question that we, we would probably workshop. Uh, Lois? Yeah, oh, I think we've got, finally got his name as well. He gave it earlier, in fact. It's Revenge. He no. gave, I think he gave it in the song. Did he now? Did he now? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not terribly clear, but but it, I think that must be what it is. Ah, well, well that 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 links him to uh, forward at least um, I, the, the, the the figure of revenge. Um, okay, that's interesting. Uh, like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, revenge, revenge will have the name, or he will die. And this is after who bears the fame, but only I. In other words, you know, it's all about revenge now. Mm. Well, he's been the chief, the chief architect of that. Well, he's not the chief, you know. He's he's encouraged it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, other thoughts before we move forward? Nope. Okay. So we're still mid 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 sequence. Uh, so uh, we've just had Orestes and Aegisthus uh, squaring off, and now they go to fight. Strike up your drum and fight a good while. So it's uh, it's it, it's not the battle that is long. This is a good while. So uh, decide which is longer, and then let some of Aegisthus' men fly, and then take him and let Orestes draw him violently, and let the drums cease. Oh, villain traitor! Now the gods, nay mortal man, shall save thy corpse from death. For blood, for blood, my father's death doth crave. O oh, tyrant fierce, couldst thou vouchsafe my father for to slay? But now no force, for thou hast wrought at last thine own decay. Alack, alack, yet spare my life, Orestes, I thee pray. Thy life? Nay, traitor vile, that chief I do deny. For as thou hast deserved, so shall I thy, thy fate requite that once could seem to me and mine for to work such despite. Therefore come forth, for thy fate received due punishment. Repent, I say, this former life, for this is my judgment, that for my father's death, the which we find thee chief to be the cause of, thou shalt be hanged where we thy death may see. And as thou for my father's death due punishment receive, so shall my mother in likewise, for that she gave thee leave, him for to slay, and eke to it with good will condescend. Therefore, come off, and soon dispatch, that 
we had made an end. O oh, heavy fate, and chance most ill, woe worth this hap of mine. Forgive my fault, you sacred gods, and to my words incline your gracious ear, for cause of first I was. This is most plain of Agamemnon's death, wherefore I must receive this pain. Pardon, I crave, vouchsafe ye gods the same to grant it me. Now, soldier, work thy will in haste, I pray thee heartily. Fling him off the ladder, and then let one bring in his mother, Clytemnestra, uh, but let her look where Aegisthus hangeth. Ah, heavy fate! Would God I had in turmoil great been slain, since nothing can Horestes' hands from shedding blood restrain. What chance you did not then lament his father when you slew, but now, when death doth you prevent, too late it is for to rue. Yet hope I that he will me grant my life that I should have. Even as much as thou vouchsafest his father life to save, therefore come off. We must not stay all day to wait on thee. Lo, mighty prince for whom ye sent, lo, present here is she. Have mercy, son, and quite remit this fault of mine, I pray. Be merciful, Horestes mine, and do not me deny. Consider that in me thou hadst thy human shape composed. That thou should slay thy mother's son, let it not be disclosed. Spare to pierce my heart with sword, and eke unto thy mind, Oedipus fate, and as Nero, show not thyself unkind. And they take down Aegisthus and bear him out. Like as a branch once set a fire, hath caused the tree to burn. As Socrates supposeth, so a wicked wight does turn these that be good, and cause them eke his evil to sequest. Wherefore the poet Juvenal doth think it for the best, that those that live licentiously should bridle be with pain, and so others that else would sin, thereby they might restrain. For thus he saith that cities are well governed indeed, where punishment for wicked ones by law is so decreed, and not decreed, but exercised in punishing of those which law and the pain from wallowing still in vice their mind dispose. And as thou hast been chiefest cause of yielding up thy breath, so call to mind, thou wast the cause of Agamemnon's death, for which, as death is recompense of death, so eke with thee, for killing of my father, thou now killed eke shall be. This thing to see accomplished, revenge with thee shall go, now have a hence, since that you all my judgment here do know. Alack, alack, withdraw thy hand, my son, from shedding blood. Oh, to fool, thus fall to prate. This does doth Orestes good. Come on away. Thou dost no more but him with words molest. A foolish fool that thou art dead. He takes it for the best. And Clytemnestra kneels down. If ever any pity of mother plant in thee, let it appear, Orestes mine, and show it unto me. What pity thou on father mine did cursedly bestow, the same to thee at present I purpose for to show. Therefore, revenge, have her away, as I judgment gave, so see that she in all alike her punishment do have. Revenge. Let me alone, come on away, that thou wert out of sight. A pestilence on the crabbed queen, I think thou do delight him to molest. Come off in haste and trouble me no more. Come on, come on, it's all in vain and get you on a fall. And let Clytemnestra weep and go out. Revenge, i.e. the vice also. Now, sith we have the conquest got of all our mortal foes, let us provide that occasion we do not chance to lose. Strike up your drums, for enter now we will the city gate, for now resistance none there is, so let us in thereat. 
and he exits and all the soldiers follow him in their array and that's effectively the end of another scene um which i will need to adjust in the formatting that we've got here um oh yeah i mean we've had there's a lot of action happening here that is taking longer than the stage directions can ever impart i mean we've had two battle scenes but also we get the the hanging of agisthus here which you know that's going to take a bit of time and he st he hangs there for a fair old while a couple you know a speech or so uh before they take him down uh clytemnestra uh, echoing uh nature earlier talking about oedipus again uh second second call in the play uh, at least and it's really interesting yeah the vice character here sort of it, it's just removing any possibility of pity from Orestes mind and uh simply by calling him revenge and as the script now gets more and more explicit about he is revenge whereas you don't really get that in the opening of the play at all um he's just sort of agent of chaos and trouble um yeah it suddenly feels so much darker uh lois who's muted at present uh it's odd that uh... Uh, normally, the moment when the vice reveals his true name is is a kind of a dramatic point, you know, and it, it never actually happens here. We we just gradually realize who he is. Maybe that's what's supposed to happen as the the play goes on, as we you know watch him gloating over uh, all the steps towards evil. I mean, the other thing that's odd is just that uh, uh, it's not just that Orestes is coming with an army, but that the army is behaving. Uh, really fiendishly. I mean, there and, and Orestes' plan is to destroy everything in sight, not just to to kill his his mother and her lover. Yeah, I mean, maybe that 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 points. You know, we we're talking about the 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 song the Vice sung. Uh, you know, having that comic stop, but actually, maybe it's a lot darker than uh, than at first sight it appears. And that whole thing about mentioning a name, revenge, really showing his true face there. Um, uh, that's a thought, Dan. Right, that's I. I was wondering because I wasn't here yesterday, so I don't know actually how he was acting. But the song certainly seemed to me to be a reveal, um, in a, in I, I, especially if it's just going to be him on the stage to the audience. Mm, yeah, uh, and it, it's in a relatively different vein from I say that 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 first appearance uh, when we first met him. It's uh, uh, much lighter and much more interactive, I think. But then maybe now, now that we know this, maybe that's wrong. Lots of hands. I'll go Eric, Alan, then Francis. Yeah. Uh, for I wrote in the chat that it reminds me of Fight Club because the vice does seem to be a part of Orestes, sort of like a, another side of him. And also, he doesn't really, the vice doesn't really talk to anybody else except like maybe Clytemnestra and um, like l characters who are lower down the scale, um, you know, the, the two rustics at the beginning. Uh, but obviously, it's a different person as, as in Fight Club where, you know, you've got Brad Pitt and uh, anyway, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but it just, it's all fighty fighty and sort of a lot of talking as well. Mm -hmm. um, also, what was interesting was that they kill a clear to minister off stage. They don't, they don't let her die in public. They just sort of, they, they rob her of that sort of, whereas I guess this is just like, okay, just do it. And then is flung off the, the ladder with the harness. And, yeah. Mm. yeah, it's interesting. Um, I was almost going with uh, the question of, does anyone ever actually talk directly at the vice? Well, sort of. Um, but could we could we have it uh, that he is almost just inside his head? That's an interesting I idea. I quite like that for staging. Uh, Alan, yeah, I mean the the vice has has changed quite significantly in some ways because, as I commented yesterday, he only appears for the first half of the first half, and then he's absent for quite a significant chunk. And during that time, he's first off fermenting fights between the two vocal yokels and then appears or winding Horestes up to undertake this mission and then basically disappears for three or four scenes mm. um, and then he's come back and is a much more active character yeah, much it's... more involved with the action. It's, it's interesting. I kind of want to go back to the two rustic scene 
uh, at the beginning of the play now with sort of those fresh eyes, uh, especially as we were struggling a bit with what they were literally saying, uh, what those words were, um, and, and wondering actually uh, uh, maybe we were missing a trick there. So that might be something to workshop in the future. That's, that's really interesting. Francis? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I found that whole stage direction with the hanging of Aegisthus and... Uh, then Clatamnesta being dragged on and her seeing him hanging there and kind of knowing that's her thing. I found that really quite chilling and, th and I thought, you know, it must be, it must have been even more chilling to see it actually staged. Uh, it could be, a, you know, it could be a very powerful moment in, uh, in a stage production. And I was also wondering, and I'm sure people can tell me, here can tell me, how they would actually technically have done the hanging of Aegisthus in, uh, you, know, in, uh, you know, in this time. Um, that's an excellent question, of which I do not know precisely the answer. They clearly uh, people staged it variously, so uh, no, the no. hangings do <clears throat> do pop it uh, do pop up. I don't know if this is our earliest hanging. Um, I don't know if we've got an earlier one. Uh, nothing immediately leaps to mind. We do have some later ones, um, and uh, it was mentioned in chat. We were uh, briefly uh, talking Spanish tragedy or the orbiting uh, plays thereof. Um, uh, that uh, yeah, the, you see perhaps uh, little stirrings of, uh, of things in this, uh, which I find really interesting. Uh, I see lots of hands. I'll go to Lynn first. Oh, um, I'm out of turn, but uh, I'll, I'll just really quick. I just wanted to, uh, to point up the fact that, it, I mean, besides the technical challenges of doing an onstage hanging without hurting your actor, hanging is a really undignified form of execution. That that was a very low form of execution in in the in the period, you know, nobles were generally beheaded, uh, and common thieves and murderers and things were were hanged. So the fact that Orestes chooses to hang Aegisthus, uh, I mean, that's that in itself is kind of significant. Um, so whether the fact that Clytemnestra is evidently going to be executed off stage demeans her or elevates her, I mean, that's a that's a question because her lover is hanged that's very much that's the, that's a, that's a very demeaning kind of death and if she's going to be killed quickly if bloodily off stage that in a way is sort of of preserving her dignity a little bit mm. and as helen was yeah. just uh, just said in the chat about uh, uh you know a call back a judas hanging himself in mystery plays um so you know yes we do have uh, precedents for hanging which uh, is a very good point. Um, and we have had other little minor callbacks to that sort of earlier tradition as well. So, uh, you know, this play is looking back and forward. It's quite interesting. Uh, Dan. I wanted to circle back, not to talk about the hanging, but to circle back to um, revenge again. Um, I was looking up the, the definition for painter um, just in, in Oxford English Dictionary. And back in the day, it would have meant to deceive or artificial, feigned, unreal. Um, when I've been listening to this play, and, and when I was thinking about what, what type of tune I'd want to match with that, what, what type of track I'd want to match with the song, this, the, the verses seem to just be very jaunt. I mean, we're, we're just jauntily bouncing around, it feels like. Um, and it felt like this song was going to be the, type, the, the same type of song here. I don't feel like, I think it's going to be dark, but I don't feel like it's going to be really slow and really menacing. I think that this revenge character is meant to be propelling the plot forward there. So I purposely picked the song. I mean, it is based off of a Renaissance song that I picked, but that was kind of a long that there's bouncy tunes tune there. And I feel like it's very difficult to not be going along with the verse when I'm listening to everybody here as mm -hmm. well, to try to give a naturalistic reading of it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's more sort of Mac the Ninth territory, isn't it? Of uh, mm -hmm. something that's jaunty, but is also very dark. And uh, yeah, that feels feels very real. Um, oh, well, uh, any additional thoughts at this stage? Uh, I, uh, I don't know if I missed any hands. I, I, I sometimes do. Do be persistent. Um, okay, we will move forward into what is uh, effectively a, a new scene. So we've cleared this army, we've cleared the bodies, we've cleared those going off to be executed. Um, and uh, now we have the entrance of fame. Mm. As each man bends himself, so I report his fame indeed. If ill, then ill, through lame Trump, his fame doth, fame doth 
straight proceed. <clears throat> if good, then good, through golden trump, I blow his lively fame. Through heavens, through earth, and surging seas, I bear abroad the same. Perhaps what wind me hither dries within your mind, you muse. From Crete I come to you, my friends, I bring this kind of news. That Agamemnon's brother is arrived in this land, and eke with him his lady fair, Queen Helen, understand. Whom for to see a great frequent of people there arrive, this news to shew at this present me hither now did drive. And enter the vice <laughs> singing this song. A new master, a new, no longer I may abide, no longer I may abide by this day, Orestes now doth rue. A new master, a new, and was it not his ill, not his mother to kill, and was it not ill his mother to kill, I pray you, how say you? A new master, a new, now it's too late to shut the gate, now it's too late to shut the gate, a rest begins to rue. <clears throat> Deninque non parvis animo dati gloria vires, et fucunda facit pectora laudis amor. As Ovid saith, I am indeed the spur to each estate, for by my trump I often cause the wicked man to hate his filthy life, and eke I store the good more good to be. So much the heart and will of man is linked unto me. A new master, a new... There I will go. Tut, tut, Orestes has become a new man. Now he sorroweth. Too bad that it is so. Yet I will dress him by his oons, and I can. Who, saint Amen, good morrow, Mistress Nan. By his oons, I am glad to see thee so trick. Nay, may I be so bold at your lips to have a lick? Jesus, how coy, do you make the same? You never knew me afore, I dare say. In faith, in faith, I was to blame, that I made no curtsy to you, by the way. Who, belady Nan, thou art trim and gay. Wounds of me, she hath wings also. Who there, who, who there with a mischief, dost thou think for to go? To heaven, or to hell, to purgatory, to Spain, to Venice, to Portugal, to the Isles Canary? Nay, hey, stay a while, for a mile or twain. I will go with thee. I swear by St. Mary. Will thou have a boat, Nan, oversee thee to carry? For if it chance to fall to rain, as the weather's not hard, it may chance this, this trim gear of mine to be marred. <clears throat> Omnia si perdis famam savare momento, qua semel amissa postia nullus eris. Above each thing keep well thy fame, whatever if thou lose. For fame once gone, they memory with fame away it goes. And, what, and it once lost thou shalt, in sooth a comted like to be, a drop of rain that falleth in the bosom of the sea. <clears throat> Me fame, therefore, as Ovid thinks, no man hath power to hold. To those with whom I please to dwell, I am more rich than gold. What caused some for country's soil what caused some for country's soil themselves to peril cast, but that they knew that after death that fame of theirs shall last? Not on, but all do me desire, both good and bad likewise, as may appear if we perpend of Nero's enterprise, which first did cause his master's death, and eke whereas he lay in mother's wound to see in sooth his mother did straight slay. With this Horestes eke take place, whose father being slain, though mother's gar from mother's blood, his hands could not refrain. But like as he revenged the death of his father in his ear, so father's brother in like sort revenge hath set on fire. For he is gone, for to request the aid of princes great, so sore his heart is set on fire through raging, rigorous heat. What to determine all the kings of Greece arrived be, 
at Nestor's town, that Athens at that Athens height their judgment to decree. <clears throat> Pots and nails. Nay, now I am dressed. Is the king Menelaus at Athens arrived? And I, and I'm, I am behind to be packing the best. Least the matter in sooth too soon to be contrived. Auxilia humilia firma consensus facit. This always provided that consent make it suckers most sure for to be. Well, I will be there straightways. You shall see. And the vice goes out. As Publius doth well declare, we ought chiefest to see unto ourselves that nought be done after extremity. Ab alio expectes alteri quod fecaris. For look, what measure thou dost meet, the same again shall be at other time, at other's hand, repaid again to thee. Therefore I wish each, wh each wight to do to others as he would, that they, in like occasion, unto him offer should. Well, for thy must, some news to hear, for fame nowhere can stay. But what she hears throughout the world, abroad she doth display. And fame goes out as well, and we'll pause there. So we have this little <laughs> interlude of the vice and fame. Um, and it's an interesting question. Are they really talking to each other? Are they having a conversation? Is this happening in parallel? Um, it's this really interesting things going on. I see uh, lots of uh, moving about. Lois. Yeah, I think what happens there, I mean, I was wondering at first when uh, the vice started addressing Nan, whether he was being incredibly rude to some poor woman in the audience, but I think in fact he's talking to to fame because he comments on her having wings uh, and uh, he treats her as if, uh, you know, she were an available woman. I mean, he's incredibly insulting to her. Uh, he seems to be getting nastier and nastier really as the play goes on. Yeah, it's like, it's like you have this sort of awkward, um, well, uh, sort of unpleasant audio commentary going on. Mm. Um, uh, the, what, what, you know, so that we're what, we're watching the DVD extra of uh, of uh, Vice uh, commenting on fame, um, and um, yeah, it's it's a really interesting choice. Um, other thoughts in the room? F fame or uh, uh, Helen? Yes, I, I'm convinced by what Lois says. Um, I had assumed that he was picking on members of the audience. But no, I think I think I think Lois is absolutely right. Mm. It hadn't occurred to me that you could call fame Nam. Hadn't <laughs> <laughs> yeah. occurred to fame either, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably true. <laughs> Yeah. Well, fame keeps going pretty heroically then, <laughs> with all this undercutting. Yeah, presumably well, fame doesn't hear him. I mean, even though he hears her, I think. Well, it's it's an interesting question, actually. Could this be almost a parallel text rather yeah. than one after the other? I mean, it, it, of which, you know, there are uh, examples uh, where plays do this. I mean, you'd expect mm. it to be slightly more formally set out or the stage directions to say it. But, you know, is this a thing where fame is trying to make their speech and... The vice just keeps undercutting it, um, and uh, and is trying to pretend he isn't there, uh, or, or or not. It's it's a really interesting question about how to do this scene. Uh, contrary opinions, uh, affirmations, uh, other thoughts. Fame, how was it for you? I mean, how was that speech? It's a uh, it's a tricksy one. Oh yeah, it is. Um, to be honest, I, I I I need to go over and read it again because I I was more um, I was more focused on sort of getting the words out and articulating them properly, and not stumbling because this um, linguistically this is quite a dense play I think. Mm. So yeah, I was yeah I was more um, focused on the the actual speaking than the meaning. Yeah. But I think it's an interesting scene, and it's, mm. th that's a very interesting question that's been raised. I think it just depends on how the director wants to stage that scene. It could be, um, it could be talking to each other. <clears throat> it could be just Vice commenting on what Fame is saying. Because mm. you know, it's Fame as, as its reputation. You know, when, once you've done the deed like this and that, how, how that spreads, what that does to you, and and you can't you can't go back uh, or can you? Mm. Fame management consultants, I'm sure, are out there. Um, uh, uh, other thoughts? 
before we move forward. Uh, Helen? Yes, um, suckers. Mm. I'm not entirely sure of the early modern meaning of the word. Uh, yeah. That it? consent makes maketh suckers for most sure for to be. Um, just before vice goes out. Uh, yeah, let me just have a look to see in the original spelling whether that's uh, just a. a uh, uh, it is, no, it's exactly suckers in the original. Yeah, um, I, I will see if there's a gloss, uh, anything we can get on that. Uh, nothing I, there. I uh, think. I think it's sucker, S-U-C-C-O-U-R, help. Ah, uh, yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, uh, because it, it actually goes with the Latin anyway. It must be auxilia, yeah. yeah. Auxilia, humility, uh, firm. yes, yes, yes. Mm. It's sucker. Mm. Yes, I've got a gloss of assistance, but uh, yes, just uh, suckle rather than sucker. I think yeah. that today's audience, both meanings can work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With this character, especially. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, let's move. Oh, Eric, sorry. I was going to say that it's, it's kind of interesting that Vice has now just, you know, decided that he's bored because um, Orestes has gone back, sort of now in repenting or, you know, feel, feeling guilty or crying or whatever it is. And sort of like, yeah, that's not the kind of behavior that Vice goes for. Mm. Uh, okay. Alan. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing, and the suckers one brings it to mind. When I did the light modernization on this, there is a heck of a lot of um, homophones in this script. And I haven't caught all of them by any means. I spotted several along the way where this, the spelling would be different um, and would probably make the meaning more clear. Mm. Uh, Lois? Yeah, I'm just um, remembering that what actually happens, at least in the, the Aeschylus trilogy, is that uh, Orestes, after killing his mother, is pursued by Furies and goes mad. I wonder whether the vice is taking on something of the role of the Fury. Uh, I mean, even though he seems to be deserting Orestes rather than following him. I don't know. It just uh, clearly this is a, such a complete reinterpretation of the story and in other terms with the vice doing a lot of things that would be done by other characters in, in, the, in the Greek myth. Yeah, it's, 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 it's that line in the, the song as the vice comes on, uh, you know, it's now too late to shut the gate, Orestes begins to rue, you know, you, it's, it's, it's nothing. No point, no point moping uh Orestes you know that that horse is bolted um you can't shut the gate now yeah. um and that's in con con uh conversation with fame um though not necessarily literally in conversation uh Francis yeah um Vice um says twice I think a new master which mm -hmm. makes it sound like he's going to find a new victim to tempt Mm. To lead astray you know he's done you know he's done with uh, Orestes Orestes has killed his mother his job is done so it's um he's got to find a new victim yeah my mm. work here is done yeah that's yeah. yeah yeah um which yeah is a, a nicely sinister I like that moment. yeah um uh he's leached off one person he will move move on to the next mm. uh like a Revenge vampire. Uh, okay, let's move on to the next scene. Uh, and we have some people we've not met before joining people in a moment who we have. So we start off with the entrance of provision. Make room, give a place, stand there or for, stand back there for, for all my speaking, you press still the more. Give room, I say quickly and make no dalliance. It is not now time to make any tarriance. The kings here do come, therefore give way, or else by the gods I will make you, I say. And here we have the entrance uh, uh, interpolated, enter Nestor, Orestes, and Menelaus. Lo, where my god, king, uh, my, my, lo, where my lord, king Nestor, doth come, and Orestes with him, Agamemnon's son, Menelaus, a king likewise of great fame. Make room, I say, before them with shame. How sith we be here, king Menelaus, unto us we pray you. Your matter to say. For these princes here, after they have prepended, if what be amiss, it shall be amended. But see our provision, go in haste and set. Good King Idemaeus, tell him we are set. 
As your graces have willed, so I so tend I to do. I will fetch him straight and bring him you too. And he goes out, uh, pause a while till he be gone out, and then speak uh, treatably. If aught be amiss, the same soon shall be. If I have committed, amended of me. But lo, Idimaeus, the good king of Crete, is come to this place, us for to meet. And enter Idimaeus and provision, coming with his cap in his hand afore him and making way. The gods preserve your graces all and send you health for I. Welcome, Sir King, the same to you. Continue the read that we pray. Two things there is, O oh kings, that moves me thus your aids to pray, and these be it, the which to you I purpose for to say. The one is this, wherewith I find myself aggrieved to be, that on such sort my sisters slain as all your graces see. The other is that to her son without all kind of right should to his mother in such case, I say, work such despite. These two be they, wherefore I crave your aids to join with me, to the intent of such great ills, revenged I may be. That thus he did, behold the state of all my brother's land, and see, I pray you, in what place the same doth present stand. His cruelty is such, in sooth, as neither tower nor town that letted once his passage, but is brought into the ground. The fatherless he pitied not, whereas he ever went. The aged wight whose years before their youthly power had spent. The maid whose parents at the siege defending of their right was slain. The same this tyrant hath oppressed through his might. The widow that through foreign wars was left now comfortless, he spared not but them and theirs he cruelly did distress. Wherefore, sith that he thus hath wrought, as far as I can see, from my seen land we should provide him exiled to be. Sith that you have accused me, I must my answer make, and here before these kings of Greece this for my answer take. Uncle, that I never went, revengement for to do, on father's foes, till by the gods I was command thereto, whose hests no man dare once refuse, but willingly obey, <coughs> that I have slain her willfully, and truly, you do say. I did, but I could not choose. It's hard for me to kick, sith God's command, as one would say, in faith against the prick. In that you say I spared none, your graceful well may see, little mercy they supposed in sooth to show to me when they had they bade me do my worst requesting them to yield it is no jest when soldiers join to fight within a field thus i suppose sufficiently i answered have to end your great complaint the which you so mightily did defend Indeed, as Hermes, Hermes doth declare, no man can once eschew the judgment of God most just for those his faults is due, for that for his faults is due. As God is most merciful, so is he just likewise, and will correct most surely those that his hests despise. As you, good King Endemaeus, have said, so likewise I, who think it is true. Therefore, as now, I do him here defy, that one dare say that he hath wrought the thing that is not right. Lo, here my glove to him I give in pledge with him to fight. I promise here to prove thereby Orestes not to do, but that was just, and that the gods commanded him thereto, that he is king of Mycenae land, whoever do deny. I offer here my glove with him, therefore to live and die. If none there be will undertake his title to with say, let us be friends unto him now. My lords, I do ye pray. It was the part of such a knight, revenged for to be. Should Orestes content himself, his father slain to see? No, no, a righteous fact, I think, the same to be indeed, sith that it was accomplished so, as gods before decreed. 
Indeed, I must confess that I revenge it should have been, if that my father had been slain with such great cruelty. But yet, I would, for nature's sake, have spared my mother's life. O oh, wretched man, O oh, cruel beast, O oh, mortal blade and knife. Peace off, Sir King, leave mourning. Lo, not can it you avail, notwithstanding, be ruled now, we pray, by our counsel. Consider first your one estate, consider what may be a joyful mean to end at length this your calamity. Orestes, he is young of years, and you are somewhat old, and sorrow may your grace too soon within her net enfold. Therefore it's best you do forget, so shall you be at ease, and I am sure Orestes will endeavor you to please. So far as it for him may be with honor leave to do. He will not shrink, but will consent your grace's bidding to. For assurance of your good will Orestes here doth crave, your daughter fair Hermione in marriage for to have. Thereby, for to continue still true love and amity, that ought in sought betwixt to such indifferent for to be. Uh, as for my friendship, he shall have, the gods his helper be. But for my daughter's marriage, I cannot grant to be. She, she is but young and much unfit such holy rites to take. Therefore, Sir Kings, at this present, no answer I can make. She is a dame of comely grace. Therefore, King Menelay, grant this to us the strife to end. O King, we do the pray. For each of them agreed, be the other for to have. Good sir, grant this that at thy hands so justly we do crave. Oh, noble king, what that it were I could not you deny. I must needs grant when naught I have against you to reply. Orestes, here before these kings, my son, I do thee make. And thee, O king, while life doth last, for father I do take. Rightful joy is this thing to us, happy for your state. Therefore, with speed, let us go hence, the marriage to celebrate. And all the gods I pray preserve and keep you both from woe. Come on, Sir King, shall we from hence unto our palace go? As it shall please your grace indeed, so we consent to do. And we likewise, O gracious prince, do condescend thereto. And they all go out. Um, yes, it's interesting. We've got that sort of nuncius, um, officious person uh, doing what we find in medieval drama, but also lots of interludes of make room, get out of the way, give place. Uh, the room we're in is quite crowded um, and, uh, and uh, uh, make way for the, the important people. Um, and that's always a bit of fun. Always enjoy that. Uh, I really love the, the stage direction. Pause a while till he be gone out. You know, wait, <laughs> wait, people. Um, and that's that's an interesting thing. So what's going on in this scene? Um, it's it's it seems it's an interesting shift. Again, we're going in a very different direction. Mm. Um, did you see this coming? Did you see this coming, people? Yeah. <laughs> Lynn, Lynn's head is just doing all sorts of things there. <laughs> How was that for you, Lynn? OK, that's just weird. I, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I, you know, I, I did a little bit of reading of translations of Greek tragedy when I was an undergrad back when woolly mammoths roamed the earth. And, and never have I got a, a, a hint of a, of a competing version of this myth where Menelaus came in and said, OK, well, she killed my brother, but you shouldn't have killed her. Like, what is what is Menelaus's deal here? It just seems so weirdly unmotivated or like, or is his real motivation, oh, I'm gonna pretend to be um, defending my sister-in-law's, uh, you know, revenging my sister-in-law's death so I can take over my brother's kingdom. I mean, what? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't get it. <laughs> uh, other thoughts from the room, Lois? Yes, I thought that speech of his was really a mess. I mean, I, there, there must be something wrong with it because for one thing, he says there are two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, um, he killed uh, Clytemnestra. The other is that he killed Clytemnestra. And, uh, and he doesn't seem to, uh, to have any 
uh, he, he doesn't seem to be aware of which of them he's related to, or uh, I don't know, the, the, the thing just didn't seem to have any kind of logical uh, progression. Um, yeah, Helen. Yeah, the other fun one is that never in a Greek myth does such an incredibly aged general as Nestor actually throw down a gauntlet. <laughs> Yeah. It just just wasn't a Greek thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Menelaus's point about how Orestes has laid waste the country um, makes more sense. I mean, that's uh, uh, I mean that's presumably his brother's country and therefore potentially his own. Uh, but uh, nobody. Well, and then or and Orestes' reply is kind of weird. I mean, he seems to think he's completely justified himself, but. Uh, I mean, his point is, if you make war, this is what happens, I guess. Mm. Uh, other thoughts? Uh, Eric? Well, I think at this point, the characters are sort of, they're just using the names of these famous characters and just like sort of going with it, but not like following the myth, because obviously, you know, there's been no mention, like as Helen said yesterday, there's been no mention of if, if it's Denia or like any other sibling <laughs> Electra uh, that uh, Orestes has and well you know Menelaus kind of it, it, it's a strange game he'd be playing unless like Helen is around and tries to sort of I don't know back up so, some sort of like support for um, her sister because Clit Clit Clytemnestra is her sister um, I don't know it just doesn't really make much sense it's just like hey we wanted to have a wedding so why not well, I, i'm just wondering you know is this kind of show that in the you know, 1560s people are like classicists are walking out going well they're, they're, this is all wrong uh i mean why can't they just do class why can't they just do it properly just tell the story <laughs> um you know why, why, why did, you know why can't they get this these details right i mean you know, it's, um i'm just <laughs> is it designed to annoy in that sense or is it uh is it just, uh, or is there just simply a source that, or had already done this that we're missing, and uh, it's just our personal ignorance uh, that is uh, is uh, shading that way? Eric. Uh, also, I forgot to mention that uh, I think, if I remember correctly, I don't know if this was actually done or just like some sort of element of myth that has been mistaken by mythographers and stuff. But supposedly, uh, like if you murdered someone, you had to go through like a sort of blood cleansing ritual sort of to cleanse the blood from your hands basically so i don't know if like maybe that's what the marriage is for to sort of turn over a new leaf in this case yes because we haven't nobody's really mentioned this 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 marriage that suddenly turns up and menelaus isn't isn't wholly keen on the whole idea of going as for my friendship you shall have um but my daughter's marriage uh, not sure uh a bit young young um so yeah it, it really comes from left field doesn't it it's sort of, we were not expecting a marriage to be organized at the for this scene at all when we came in uh, were we um so yes yeah keeps throwing us curveballs as this play uh lois yeah i'm not sure if this is the earliest example of this technique of using a marriage as a way of resolving a feud. I mean, uh, obviously we get it later in the troublesome reign, for example, where uh, that's sort of supposed to solve everything between England and France, and it obviously doesn't. But right. uh, uh, they may all be getting it from Edward Hall, uh, who called his history the union of the two noble families of Lancaster and York, and who talks about marriage indeed as the the solution, you know, the, the way to bring peace. So. Uh, uh, I mean, I keep wondering, I'm sure people have written on this play. I haven't uh, read anything on it, but I'm, I'm sure it's been seen as having some sort of political relevance. Uh, well, yes, there are there are some interesting uh, theories on uh, on uh, on the then political re resonances that might uh, be in play, but uh, some of them are uh, more more speculative than others, and we may uh, touch on them later. Uh, let's go on at this stage because uh, we have a uh, an epic. Uh, one man show coming up now uh, as the next scene is is all vice it's all vice uh, so the vice entereth with a staff and a bottle or dish and wallet I would I were dead and laid in my grave boons of me I am trimly promoted oh, oh. oh well now for my labour these trinkets I have why see you not I pray you how I am flouted. A bag and a bottle, thus am I lauted. 
Each knave nowadays would make me his man, but she'll master them. I be his ooze, and I can. A begging, a begging. Nay, now I must go. Orestes is married, God send him much care, and I revenge am driven him fro. And then it's no marvel, though I be thus bare. But peace, who better than beggars doth fare? For all they be beggars and have no great port. Who is merrier than the poorest sort? What, shall I beg? Nay, that's too bad. Is they near a man that a servant doth lack? Of mine honesty, gentlewoman, I would be glad. You to serve but for clothes, to put on my back. <sighs> Away with these rages, from me thee shall pack. What think you scorn me your servant to make? Another will have me, if you me forsake. And puts off the beggar's coat and all thy things. Perhaps you all marvel of this sudden mutation. How soon I was down from so high a degree. To satisfy your minds, I will use a persuasion. This one thing you know, that one called amity, is unto me revenge most contrary. And we twain together could not abide, which caused me so soon from high state to slide. Orestes and his uncle, King Menelaus, is made such sure friends without peradventure. Though the policy of old Idemaeus, that as far as I can see, is, it is too hard to enter. Yea, and that's worse. When I sought to venture, I was driven without comfort away from their gate. I was glad to be packing for fear of my pate. Yet, before I went, my fancy to please, the marriage celebrated at the church I did see, willing I was, them all to disease. But I durst not be so bold for Master Amity. Sent by Menelaus and bore him company. On the other side, duty with Orestes bore sway, so that I could not enter by no kind of way. Well, sith from them both, I am banished so. I will seek a new master, if I can him find. Yet I am in good comfort, for this well I know, that the most part of women to me be full kind. If they say near a word, yet I know their mind. If they have not all things, when they do desire, they will be revenged, or else lie in the mire. Nay, I know their qualities. The less is my care. As well as they do know revenge's operation, ye fall to it, good wives, and do them not spare. Nay, I'll help you forward if you lack but persuasion. What man is most free from invasion? For, as plainly Socrates, declareth unto us, women, for the most part, are born malicious. Perhaps you will say, many one that I lie, and other some, I am sure, also will take my part. Notwithstanding what I have said, they will verify, yea, and do it is, do it I wis, in spite of thy heart. If therefore thou wilt live quietly after their desert, reward them. So shalt thou bride or their affection, and unto thy will shall have them in subjection. In Athens dwelt Socrates, the philosopher divine, who had a wife named Exantype, both devilish and ill, which twain being fallen upon, out upon a time, perhaps cause Exantype, she could not have her will. He went out of doors, sitting there still. She crowned him with a piss pot, and there he was wet to the skin most pitiful to see. I pray God that such dames be not in this place, for then I might chance near our mistress to get. Nay, if ye anger them, they will lay you on the face, or else their nails in your cheeks they will set. Nay, like a razor, some of their nails are wet, that not for to pair, but to cut to the bone. I count him most happiness that meddles with none. Well, fare you well, for I must be packing. Remember my words and bear it in mind. What, suffer the mill a while to be clacking. If that you intend any ease for to find, then will they be to you both loving and kind. 
Farewell, cousin Cutpurse, and be ruled by me, or else you may chance to end on a tree. And the vice goes out. Um, is always uh, speaking to members of the audience, accusing at least one person of being a cut purse. That's uh, again fairly standard um, uh, sort of audience participation. Uh, you're a thief, aren't you? Of course you are. Um, not trusting you. Um, yeah, all sorts of interesting things here um, from you know coming in as a beggar and casting that off um his interpretation of what's going on in the rest of the plot and then his 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 dancing around ideas Re really really interesting um and the sense of the play sort of fading away to a degree we know the vice um uh, setting away the idea of uh, duty who we met obviously him sort of heckling earlier holding sway with Orestes that uh, I could not enter by no kind of way. I mean, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm just now starting to think of that earlier scene with duty is, is Orestes sitting in the middle and they're either side and they're fighting over his soul. I don't think that's it at all, but you know, that just sort of leapt at me. Um, Lois. Yeah, what's odd is that uh, that's a scene they could have staged and they didn't. I mean, they just have him um, talking about it, which which is, you know, relatively undramatic. But I suppose it's a way of making sure the audience gets the point that that where you've got amity and duty, you don't have revenge. Uh, and uh, it's also interesting that he builds in the audience response. I mean, he offers to be a servant to this woman in the audience, and she obviously is going to say, no, no way. And then he can say, oh, you don't want me, huh? And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's quite cleverly done. And then, it can, and then it goes with all this diatribe about women and how revengeful they are. Uh, though oddly enough, I mean, as everybody keeps pointing out, you know, there is no mention of Iphigenia. I mean, it's perfectly true that Clytemnestra initially was taking revenge for uh, her husband's killing of his daughter, but uh, this is never mentioned. And, and yet we get all this about how women are so revengeful. Yeah, and you've got to really pick, uh, be careful who you pick out of the audience for that one, uh, depending on if, if, it's, if it's a court, but you've got to be careful with that one. Play, uh, read the room, read the room before you go too far with that one. Uh, Alan. I must admit, I'm, I'm seeing that sequence um, almost as being as a front of tabs number while they set up for the coronation sequence, which is upcoming. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. That's, I think, the way it will be staged these days. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it is interesting that we've, we we do seem to have these sort of A, B scene structure where we have the slightly more dramatic big scenes with lots of stuff going on, um, bookended by uh, slightly simpler, not always solo, but uh, certainly smaller scale action. So um, that does seem to be deliberate. And yes, I think it is that sense of, uh, yeah, one or two people on stage, three people. Uh, while the big stuff's getting organised, uh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, Dan, I mean, you 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 coped with the whole whole of that. I mean, um, you know, it's a it's a big old chunk. So I'm expecting a um, a hell of a lot of uh, good stuff to follow this in terms of spectacle. Otherwise, I'd be very disappointed. Uh, how was it for you? Yeah, lovely. Um... <laughs> I, I don't know what else to say about it. I feel like there is a lot that can be done with this. I, I feel like that he's got to be somewhat of a fan favorite out there if he's going to be giving this long speech and basically have everyone eating out of his hand, which I think does go along with just the way that this character has developed throughout the play, um, that he's, that yeah, he might be the villain, I mean, a, a boo his villain, but yeah, you, you kind of want him to succeed in a way. Mm. Well, Eric. I was thinking that, um, well, at first I thought maybe this is going to be like a setup, sort of like, you know, pretending to go off and then coming back eventually or something. Um, but we then, might. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah. There's still more time. Well, I haven't read ahead. <laughs> so um, as, as, you, as I know you like us, you know, to do. But I was thinking that um, beggar, like dressing as a beggar and getting disguised and stuff, like there doesn't seem to be a real point to it except to make people feel sorry for him um whereas like in other plays where we've seen you know vices being disguised and stuff it's usually sort of deceive um but like we we all know who he is so or yeah uh, it just seems kind of an interesting choice to sort of go 
Yeah, I'm a beggar now. I'm mo I'm moving out and I'm leaving. <laughs> I don't care what you do. I'm leaving. Yeah, it's kind of yeah an interesting yeah. choice. And that it is a it is a it is a thing that he just casts off, and uh, you know, so it's it's a misdirection. Um, uh, about you know, like oh, we're having a happy ending now. That's sort of where it's going. There's going to be a marriage, and then he comes on it in beggar's weeds. Ah, revenge has been got rid of, uh, uh, and then you get something a lot more ambiguous. Uh, yes, he's he's may have lost this battle, but he not, hasn't necessarily w lost the war. He, revenge will return, uh, or may return. I'll be in, back. Yeah, in <laughs> different guises. Um, uh, Lynn, did you? Yeah, I, I'm thinking back to I can't remember the name of the the play, but there was we we there was some discussion during that reading of of how. It was very hard to pin the, the comic character, the clown character down, like what kind of clown is it? And, and, and when we talked about the fact that it doesn't really matter, he doesn't have to be the same kind of character from one scene to the next. He's just the funny guy who has different shticks that are kind of shoehorned into the, the plot. And it seems like there's a little bit of that going on here too. Like a few scenes ago, he's like, ooh, I have done my job, I'm moving on. You know, my work here is done, I'm gonna go annoy somebody else. And now he's like, oh, I lost my job, I'm so sad. Is it, yeah, so I don't know, I find this speech very odd and actually, I'm sorry, not especially pleasant. His little misogynist uh, tangent uh, is, uh, it, I can't say I enjoyed that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm. One for the queen there, always, always, uh, the, you know, that's the question, if, if, if it is uh, indeed for such an occasion. Uh, Eric? Well, also, because in, I, I don't know how much, because uh, we, we thought at the beginning that they might know quite a lot about classical Greek tragedy and that kind of stuff, uh, or at least some of the classics. Um, so it, it seems interesting that he chooses to be a beggar because in classical Greek tragedy, you always have that recognition moment where someone dresses as someone else. And it's like, oh, you're especially in like the Orestes uh, cycle, you've got like the whole him dressing up to sort of not be detected by his sister who is about to kill him mm. um, and sort of all that stuff. So it's, it's interesting that he chooses to, to become a beggar. I don't know why that's sort of attracting my attention, but yeah. Well, I think there are questions that, you know, a bit of uh, work and research will be able to answer of just actually precisely how the transmission of ideas and sources has reached this text. I, I, I think there's uh, and that there might be some interesting reasons why certain decisions has, has come here um, uh, and, and how that goes. I don't think we need to worry too much about it at this time, but um, that's definitely something to flag up for the future um, and do a little a little bit of time to uh, to perhaps pass some of that. Uh, let's close the play. I think we've got one more scene to go. I think we should we should uh, tidy everything up. Uh, so we have uh, the uh, enter Orestes and Hermione, who we've uh, not met but we've heard of. Nobility and commonalty uh, enter as well, as well as truth and duty, who are presumably taking carrying the crown. Sith that the gods have given us grace, this realm for to possess, which flourisheth abundantly with gold and great richess. Let us now see how much he, the wills and mind of all this land is unto us, and of their state likewise to understand. I deem of them, Orestes mine, that they contented be, with humble heart for to submit, O king, themselves to ye. Wherefore, my love, inquire their state this present time, and have their hearts good will to us. King, let them divine. As I do love thee, lady bright, so eke I think indeed that love for love as equally shall re reward of mead. And let duty and truth take the crown in their right hands. The gods never prolong my life, that day I shall appear, to break my faith to thee now plight, my loving lord so dear. Come on, my lords and commons eke, let me now understand of all your minds, for I desire to know what case this land doth now consist vouchsafe the same, therefore to show to me, and if that aught be now amiss, amended it shall be. 
Most regal prince, we are now void of mortal war's vexation, and through your grace we are joined in love with every nation, so that your nobles may now live in pleasant state certain, devoid of wars and civil strifes, while that your grace doth reign, the which you may, I pray the God, with happy days and bliss, and after death to send you there, where joys shall never remiss. Yes, well, jo where joys shall never miss. As a sign of our obedience, lo, duty doth thee crown, and truth also, which doth me bind, thy subject to be found. My nobles all, I give you thanks for this. I apologise, sorry. Uh, let truth and duty crown Orestes at this moment. My nobles all, I give you thanks for this now showed to me, and as you have, so equal I the like show unto thee. My commons, how goes it with you? Your state, now let me know. Whereas such, whereas such one as you do reign, their needs must riches grow. We are, O king, eased of the yoke which we have so desired. The state of this, our commonwealth, need not to be inquired. Peace, wealth, loy and felicity, O king, it is we, it is we have. And what thing is there the which subjects ought more to crave? Since all things is in such a good state, my commons, as you say, that it may so continue still the sacred gods, I pray. And as to me, your trust in us shall anyways be found, so still to maintain your estate, I surely shall be bound. And for your faithful hearts, the which you granted have to me, both your, you, my lords, and common seeke, I thank you heartily. Therefore, sith time will have an end, and now my mind you know, let us give place to time, and to our palace let us go. We both will wait upon your grace, if it please you to depart. Even when you please to wait you on, I shall with all my heart. And go out all, except for truth and duty who speak. Kingdom kept in amity, and void of dissension, nay divided himself by any kind of way, neither provoked by words of reprehension, must needs long continue, as truth doth say. For dissension and strife is the path to decay, and continuing therein must of necessity be quite ruinate and brought unto misery. Where I, duty, am neglected of any estate, their strife and dissension my place do supply. Cankered malice, pride, and debate. Therefore, to rest all means do try. Then ruin comes after their state, whereby they are utterly extinguished, leaving naught behind, whereof so much as their name we may find. He that leadeth life as his fancy doth like, though for a while the same he may hide, yet truth the daughter of time will it seek, and so in a time it will be descried. Yet in such time as it cannot be denied, but received due punishment, as God shall see, for the fault committed most convenient to be. As a story here hath made open unto ye, which if he it hath been marked, much profit may arise. For as truth saith, nothing written will be, but for our learning in any kind of wise, by which we may learn the ill to despise and the truth to imitate. Thus truth doth say, the which for to do, I beseech God, we may. For your gentle patience, we give you thanks heartily. And therefore our duty, Wade, let us all pray for Elizabeth, our queen, whose gracious majesty may reign over us in health for a. Likewise for her counsel, that each of them may have the spirit of grace their doings to direct in setting up virtue and vice to correct. For all the nobility and spirituality, let us pray. For judges and head officers, wherever they may be, according to our bounded duties, especially I say, for my Lord Mayor, Lieutenant of this noble city, and for all his brethren, within the, with the commonality, that each of them doing their duties all right, and after death possess heaven to their heart's delight. 
and the play ends and uh, and that is uh, that is that and we get uh, uh, our now fairly uh, conventional um call on uh, uh pray for the queen uh and pray for all our uh, councillors and advisors um which we have in so many other plays uh slightly earlier and around about the same time uh you know it's always good to keep the com country in amity uh I don't have dissension uh keep it all in one 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 chunk that's always good don't split the kingdom up always goes badly um yeah uh all sorts of uh common themes that we uh we we uh we we have um popping up all over the place so yes that final scene everything sort of come together um so do we feel that orestes um sort of got away with murder there um <laughs> you know it's like and he murdered his mother and gets married and lives happily ever after. He certainly married the right person. Mm. She's her grasp on statecraft is a lot better than his. Mm. Never mind that she's his first cousin, but that you know that's twice. <laughs> yeah, they're they're basically genetically brother and sister. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Royalty. That's what they do. Yeah. Um, fairly standard practice there. Uh, Francis. Yeah, I find it extremely dubious that, you know, Catamnestra is killed for committing murder. And Menelaus, uh, not Menelaus, Orestes um, gets a wife and a kingdom. <laughs> Punishment? <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> the patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> Helen. I mean, in the myth, the judgment given at the at Orestes' trial in Athens, as I remember it, and the Grecians will correct me if I'm wrong, the, the judgment is that as a man's life is worth more than a woman's, Orestes was right to kill his mother for killing his father. Uh, Lynn, I think, has a response to that. Um, my memory... But I, you know, this is a, a while ago. Isn't it, it, you know, what Athena says in the end of the Oresteia isn't so much that the father's life is worth more, is that the father is basically more of a, is a closer relation. That the, uh, the, yes, of the analogy is that the woman is just the ground that the seed grows in. So a, a, a person's mother isn't really related to that person. They're just- That's the, right, that's kind of right. That, that 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 person was grown in, and that the father is really the seed that that went into the ground. So your father is more closely related to you than your mother was the mm. rationale, as I remember it. Yeah, and also the 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 whole process of that play and, uh, ends with you know a lengthy trial uh, and a, a split verdict, and and you know it's all very close. And you're saying, well, we've got this on one side, this on the other. How do we pass this? And goes right. into great detail about what you do with an almost un insoluble case whereas this play just gets married right right so it's a much narrower thing and that's after he's tortured by the furies for some time so yeah. yes so it, it's much of, it's a much closer thing it is the and athena has to cast the deciding vote and and the, and and he's already suffered quite a bit yeah so this is a much different sort of ethical lens that 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 event is viewed through yeah, this feels much more like the chumocracy, doesn't it? Uh, Francis? Yeah, moving on from Lynn's point, um, this uh, about the, the father and the son being sort of closer relations than the mother and the son, um, this, this play makes emphasises several times the physical connection between mother and son, mm. which, is, uh, which is interesting. Mm. Yeah, because uh, we had, um, I think it was last time they were talking about, you know, suckling on uh, on, on his uh, uh, mother's mother's uh, paps and things yeah. like that, and uh, and, and ref referencing to that connection. Uh, and yeah. to her pain at the birth. Yes, yeah, and I think there's a mention of her womb at some point. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Eric. I find it interesting how, like, nature has disappeared. It's just like... <laughs> Well, you 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 sort of served your time. You've been guilty for a while, so maybe we're not going to give you another like sort of 
ass kicking or something, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, it just feels like, you know, sort of nature is, is the sort of plants the seeds of guilt and then, but he still goes ahead and then still regrets what he's done. So it's kind yeah. of... He feels a yeah. bit sad, but he's not chased by furies. Um, you know, he's in the dumps a bit. Uh, Dan? I wonder, I mean, I was going to save this for the final comments, but you, as you may know, they, the title page actually does have them set out for how they want all the characters to be doubled. And, yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting how Vice is the one who was assigned also to play nature and duty there. And I wonder if that's a commentary on that Vice subsuming nature. And I wonder how many other pairings or couplings there are that um, were intentional. I'm sure they were intentional. Well, that's, that's one of the questions because the doubling... I mean, just about sort of works uh, for six, um, but there's sort of questions as to whether that's to do with the production or that whether that's a printed thing uh, yeah. that's, that's been devised afterwards. Um, it, it, it just about sort of works, but you, it also assumes that there's going to be an, a lot of additional supernumeraries who are not mentioned in that. Yeah. Uh, so it's 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 a bit up in the air as to how whether that re really reflects the play uh, or not. But it's a good point because uh, you know it, it, it just about works. Uh, Eric. Well, I guess also if you look at it, like the whole play it's sort of uh, through an Arthurian lens where you've got like the whole, you know, he's the next in line. He's the he's the actual heir to what, you know, Clytemnestra and Aegisthus were actually, you know, in charge of the kingdom and stuff. Um, it kind of makes sense that he killed her and got away with it. <laughs> um, but it kind of, because like he's sort of, you know, the one true, you know, the king or whatever you want to call him. Um, he's like narratively and sort of historically, it would have been the heir um, to inherit the sort of kingdom. Um, and having to dispose of any rivals would be normal business, I guess. And getting a wife in the process would mean he can secure an heir also. Mm. Uh, Helen. No one ever blames him for killing Aegisthus. No, nobody cares about Aegisthus. No, that's not fair. That's not <laughs> fair. Um, <laughs> he, Aegisthus had a right to live. <laughs> oh, not. I'm not. I'm not saying personally that you know, but I'm just saying that broadly speaking, nobody. Oh yeah, ever cares yeah. In about the him. great scheme of things, is it gets <laughs> this is disposable. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, it does actually feel like he got a bit of a raw deal because he was, you know, he 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 just loved her, didn't he? But then again, he did possibly uh, help with the whole murdery thing, so you know, he's 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 a bit guilty too. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's in the Aeneid where um, there's quite a bit of emphasis put on Aegisthus' guilt in in that retelling of the whole House of Atreus myth. Clytemnestra didn't murder Menelae, didn't murder Agamemnon. Aegisthus did. Uh, so, um, as opposed to the Oresteia retelling, where Clytemnestra is clearly actually wielded the knife. So, so you know, there. Uh, this author would probably have been, perhaps, intimately familiar with the uh, the Aeneid, and so maybe picked up that I guess this is the real bad guy vibe from the Aeneid. Mm. 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 Because certainly in this play, I guess this was the murderer. It's just that Clytemnestra consented to it, mm. set it up, suggested he took a bath. Mm. Yeah. Joint enterprise, I think they call it. Um, <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, yes, okay, we are approaching, I think, final thoughts for the play overall. Um, so I will start, I think I'll start with Lois, who was here yesterday and has uh, been here for the whole journey. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, just thoughts about this play. Um, and about now we've done this second half, which is is demanding so much more in terms of stagecraft and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, ability to perform it. I mean, uh, you had some thoughts yesterday about uh, sort of the, the nature of the event that might it might be performed with. Uh, does this fit within that or do you have any uh, changes to your opinions? Uh, mm -hmm. How the play functions overall? Uh, final thoughts? Yes, yesterday I certainly thought that emphasizing the fact that it was written for children, even if the children in a modern production might be played by adults in a sort of further level of distancing, uh, made sense. I'm not sure it makes as much sense with the second half, actually. I, I don't know. I found the, this really rather unsatisfactory in its ending, especially. Uh, 
you know, partly because it is morally uh, disturbing. I think it's particularly the fact that uh, that Orestes invades with the whole army and lays lays waste the whole country. I mean, if he were simply uh, revenging his uh, his father's death, one could just about see it. But uh, uh, you know, the assumption is that in order to do this, you have to make war. Uh, you have to have a reason for making war, and then when you make war, this is what happens. You know, tough. Um, so I, I mean, it's a bit harder to see playing this somehow with children. I felt that the first part could be done as a kind of showcase for you know, hypothetical children's company. And I have seen adults playing children. In fact, the, the Globe production of Dido, Queen of Carthage, had all the gods played uh, by adults who were pretending to be children, going around in shoes that were too big for them and, you know, behaving really childishly. It was a very good way of, uh, of dealing with the behavior of the gods in that play. Mm. Um, uh, Alan, final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, an interesting piece. I mean, it strikes me, and I may well be completely off theme here, but it, it seems to me very much a transitional thing because you've got elements of the morality plays with these various personifications of truth, duty, nature, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the vice who... I think we've also seen in quite a lot of the earlier stuff and then trying to bolt onto the back of that um, stuff from the Greek myths or the Greek stories. Um, I'm not entirely sure it hangs together as an, an entity. It, it seems to be a little less than focused. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that's the way it feels to me. Others may disagree with that. Well, it's 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 sort of consistent in its lack of focus. That's what I find quite interesting. It's not like it's there. There's an a plot that dominates and then it loses its way or things. We we have these constant sort of scattergun approach. I mean, it's uh, 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 but at least in terms of the the narrative thrust remains fairly linear throughout, even if it takes a bit of a left turn in the uh, the final uh, few scenes. I mean, it's not like a play like Gorbadoc, um, uh, which is, you know, uh, same decade, uh, same printer. Um, uh, and um, which which moves around an awful lot and and, and its focus shifts in, in interesting ways. Um, so, yeah, I, did, I think you're absolutely right. It is it is it is doing an awful lot of different things. Um, and yes, yeah, it's, it's a very tricky one to sort of grab hold of. Um, there's a lot of detailed work to be done for a modern production, because otherwise, I think we could we could very easily drown in uh, some of the things that it's doing, uh, and say consistency and inconsistency. That's uh, that's an interesting challenge. Dan, how was it for you? Uh, considering you missed the uh, the first session, so uh, how's the play holding together for you? For me personally, I thought it, it held together quite well. It reminded me just more of a medieval play rather than. Um, a play that's based strictly on the classics. And I think that might be where, I think it's hard for, for modern audiences, especially to remember, I guess, not remember necessarily, but not make the associations with the classics and then actually make them from the medieval, um, from the medieval source. I had read, I mean, this is my half-assed internet research on it, but that this was based off of Caxton's translation of, um, of a French source rather than the classical source. And that to me makes a lot of sense and why there might be the inconsistency or the, the I guess the incoherence with um, the classical source. Um, I would love to have been there yesterday because there's a lot of things that are interesting to me, especially as you had mentioned, the printer being the same printer as Gorbaduk. I found that this text, especially, I mean, as I mentioned, the cast listing on the front and then the very detailed stage directions. And then there's a number of other um, prints interesting printer things you'll see in it if you look at it. like there's the large latrines that are being used to start off um new scenes and um just a great attention deep detail to this text make it make it seem to me that um i i don't want to say authorly or whatever but a, a great deal of text a great deal of care was put into how this was produced as a text so i don't think that there's many it makes me feel like there are fewer accidents in terms of um, of choices being made with doubling and choices being made with directions rather than, well, at least somebody intended for it to be staged this way. 
And mm. I think it just makes it harder to get our heads around it because like I said, modern audience again. Yeah, I, that, that thing of uh, the earlier we go, the, there's, it's not quite an accurate uh, way of putting it, but there's, there's more of an individual voice and unity of, of, of what, what these productions are doing in the sense that, you know, they're, they're, they're inc more written by uh, sing single uh, individuals for single events in, in, a, in a much more contained fashion than later uh, public theatres where it's a team doing all sorts of different things, pulling texts in all sorts of different directions. So there is a sort of unity to it in that sense. Yeah. Uh, I, I absolutely agree on that. Uh, Eric, final thoughts. Uh, yeah, I, I found it interesting as you, we've already said. Um, and because we did the, that Christmas play last night with the Christmas mask. Um, I hear on the podcast podcast very soon. Yes. It's kind of, um, it actually reminded me a bit of that, where you've got one adult sort of trying to con control everything, because you had like the vice who seems very outside of everything, but is trying to control, you know, what Orestes is doing. But he doesn't, Orestes doesn't need any help with like sort of being shoved in the specific direction. He's just like maybe maybe just a little bit sort of to go, you know, just do it, get it over with, and you know, be cold and you know revenge is a distress sort of cold and all that stuff um so it's kind of it felt felt a bit like that and then like vice just drifts off and disappears and it's the it, you know the play ends with a marriage so it's like it, it is that thing of what on earth <laughs> why <laughs> um but yeah i mean we've seen those plays that are sort of very weird in this time period <laughs> like you know peddler's prophecy time dies no man all that stuff um so I, I guess in the context of that it's not strange at all um <laughs> no i mean there's something there's something there's an awful lot of it what appears at this distance to be experimentation in the 1560s it's a the, the plays are, are really fascinating uh that's i find them really quite exciting if they're not necessarily awfully commercial they're, they're really interesting uh, Francis, uh, you weren't here yesterday, but uh, how's it been for you? Um, I found it a very strange mishmash, this play, um, because, uh, you know, you have these comic rustics and then you have these these uh, classical Greek figures, uh, but there's this extreme creative license with the actual story of Orestes and Clytemnestra and Menelaus and so forth. Um, I, I, I would be firmer than Alan. I don't think this play hangs together. And I agree with you, Rob, it's, it's hard to, to grab hold of it. Um, Lois used the word unsatisfactory and um, I, I found it unsatisfactory. I, I find the, the themes of revenge and um, and, a, and in relation to that theme of forgiveness and fame, really interesting subjects, but this play doesn't deal with them in a very satisfactory way. So, yeah, I find the play quite disappointing and it has a strange, I think, emotional progression. It, it starts off on this comic note with the comic rustics um, and then it takes a darker tone, and then it ends in, with this upbeat marriage. Uh, what happened to the comic rustics as well? I kept expecting them to pop up again and um, and add some comic relief during the play's darker passages. Well, so, does, yeah, the play does pepper its, uh, you know, the, 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 we, the you know, with us with characters who we never see again. Yeah, uh, I mean it's almost Brechtian in, in in that sense. You know that we have these little asides between scenes when uh, where we just see these little vignettes. Um, I, I, it, 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 I, I wonder actually at pace and with with production whether these problems mm. are, are 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 real or not. Um, I, I think it's very important that we flag them up um, to uh, as uh, trying to find our route in, so I can find a way of. Of doing these things. Uh, Lynn, final thoughts from you. Yes, so yeah, unsatisfying is a good word. Yesterday, you know, I decided, okay, well, we've got a Greek tragedy and English morality mashup. Let's see where that goes. That could be fun. But uh, I I found, I really struggled with engaging with it much more today than I did yesterday. I had more fun 
yesterday. And that has to do with reasons that really aren't directly related to the fact that it's this weird mashup. Um, for one thing, um, uh, I, I just find it sort of ethically questionable. I find it's ethically unsatisfying. It's morally unsatisfying because Orestes gets away with murder. He never even really himself expresses remorse. He never says, I hated having to do that and I'm really sorry, uh, uh, you know? So it's not even a very Christian in that he expresses remorse and gets forgiveness. It, 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 I think that his, his murder, his matricide is treated way too lightly for it to be satisfying. Menelaus's motivation for revenging his sister-in-law and ignoring the fact that his sister-in-law murdered his brother is just, again, ethically, morally, weird and unsatisfying and the play takes way too long to end after Clytemnestra and Aegisthus are, are dead it's like that's kind of the climax and then it just kind of natters on for a while I, that long um monologue that the vice has maybe the right actor could make that entertaining but I find misogyny quite quite off-putting um, and then the play gets really preachy at the end with truth and beauty talking, and it's just tedious. So it starts off stronger than it ends, and it, the, the promise of this weird mashup and how fun that could be, I feel like never really pans out. Um, uh, Helen, final thoughts? Yeah, I... The rest of the play, I, 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 I leave to people who understand plays. Um, but the last bit in Athen, the Athenian part and the marriage, um, I mean, this is a contribution that I didn't know about to the great marriage debate of the time. Um, and I think even Orestes being forgiven for the cruelty of his army may, I'm going to have to check the dates, it may have something to do with one of her suitors having been considered to have behaved badly, probably in the Low Countries. Um, but I'm, I mean, I'm not sure how the dates fix, but it's very interesting that it's the same printer as Gorbaduk. Um, because that too was part of the, 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 the popular culture end of the, of, of, of the debate. Uh, one of the, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nothing that this room, this um, project needs to deal with, but it's what I'm taking from the play and what I'm going to be looking up when I go away. Well, um, it's it's a good place to end because uh, that's uh, I was just going to uh, briefly talk about uh, potential connections uh, with uh, history because uh, there is a play of Orestes that was performed before Elizabeth in the winter of 1567-68. Now, we don't know if it's this play. Um, so, uh, but uh, there, there is, uh, you know, a question of uh, connections in people's mind in the audience about... Um, uh, things happening in Scotland uh, with kings and uh, and uh, and murdered uh, uh, members of royalty uh, going on at exactly the same time. So, as a resonance for anyone reading this post uh, 1567, that is something else, and that's where I'm going to just circle slightly back to what Lois was talking about about a semi-historical re reenactment event kind of thing where that kind of context being fed to the audience as, a, as another interesting layer, even if it's not anything that actually is directly connected to what this text is trying to say or do, um, uh, it, uh, it, it might have a resonance in the mind of the audience that uh, uh, is a, a part of history that people, uh, or a reasonable percentage of people in the, uh, the world will know about uh, if they know about Mary Queen of Scots. So um, there's, uh, there's, there are interesting threads that, uh, that resonate with this play, even if there isn't actually a direct connection with them. Um, uh, sadly, that is where I'm going to have to end this session. Um, some, some disagreements in the room, that's fine. Um, some pros, some against. Uh, uh, lots of questions, I think lots of 
uh, workshop and play is need to be done with this. I'm quite interested in the idea of working it alongside Gorbodok and maybe one or two others. I quite like the idea of trying to really get more into the mind of what's going on in the 1560s, because uh, there, there are so many different little strands that are tugging on the medieval, the earlier Tudor court material, stuff that's getting slightly more public. Um, and all of those uh, questions, questions of what the cast is, are they boys, are they students, is it more inns of court or is it courtly and, and, and one of the boys uh, uh, groups uh, or, or what, and the questions of who should be older, who should be younger and how that all functions, because I think it, it felt, as it was stated earlier, I, I forget by whom, that you know, the, the, the question of age of the, uh, the children uh, of the actors feels very different this half than the first, uh, and that effect uh, is uh, maybe changes our, our view of it, and maybe it doesn't. So yes, uh, that was a, a interesting uh, first look at uh, at uh, uh, interlude of vice, um, and uh, we will perhaps return to it one day. All that remains to thank all the readers in the room, Alan, for preparing the text, and goodbye. Bye. Bye.